Hi, this is Matt Trefiro, CMO of Edge Infrastructure Company, Vapor.io, and co-chair of the Linux Foundation's State of the Edge project. I'm the host of Over the Edge, a weekly, hour-long interview-style podcast on edge computing and the future of the internet. You can find it at overtheedgepodcast.com and on all the major podcasting platforms, including iTunes and Spotify. Today, we're coming to you live from the Kubernetes on Edge virtual conference, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Craig McLucky, currently a VP of product at the Modern Application Platform Business Unit at VMware, but also one of the co-founders of the Kubernetes Project, the driving force behind the formation of the CNCF, and the former CEO and co-founder of Heptio, along with Joe Beta. We're going to talk to Craig about his career in technology, including the origins of Kubernetes. We're also going to cover the past, present, and future of all things Kubernetes and Edge. Hey, Craig, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Oh, yeah, this is terrific. I've been wanting to do this for a long time. You and I have uh, been friends for a while, but we've yes. never been in a, yeah, never been in an environment like this. So this is really, really kind of fun to do this. Um, so how, how did you even get started in technology? Um, it's funny, like I was, I was kind of thinking about that. And I, I think the answer was the Commodore 64, uh, as with so many uh, kids of my generation. Um, you know, as a, a sort of nerdy teenager, I discovered that programming was uh, a great kind of creative outlet for me. And so I spent most of the years from between 10 and 17, I guess, coding. Uh, and then I took a little break from it, believe it or not, during college. Um, I actually decided to pursue a different direction, uh, electrical engineering, which in South Africa meant like real <laughs> electricity. I don't think, I'm not sure that Microsoft really understood that when they interviewed me, but uh, I didn't actually do a lot of formal CS uh, coursework, but um, it was close enough that uh, enabled me to uh, get a job at Microsoft and the rest has been a great journey. Yeah, that's that's great. And so uh, when did you leave Microsoft and uh, go to Google? Um, so I left Microsoft, uh, it was back in about, uh, Roughly 2009, 2010, somewhere around there. And uh, the, my first project at Google was, uh, I kind of lucked out. Um, there was this thing called, uh, well, it became Google Compute Engine. Uh, it was called Big Cluster at the time, but that's where I met Joe Beta. And uh, sort of starting point was really just working on um, bringing traditional enterprise VMs into the uh, into the Google data center. And it was a, it was a really fun project. I learned a lot about... Uh, a lot about Google's infrastructure, um, a lot about some of the challenges of actually bringing those enterprise grade workloads uh, into that sort of cloud environment. And it, it really set me up on the journey that I've been on ever since. Well, and, and how did how did you go from Compute Engine to Kubernetes? You know, it's an interesting story. Um, you know, Joe and I, you know, poured our hearts and souls into building Compute Engine. And we felt like it was great technology. You know, it had a really clean, elegant API, um, had a lot of very favorable, um, you know, performance attributes, some really interesting uh, networking capabilities, et cetera, et cetera. But it was also kind of interesting because in some ways it was almost too little too late. Um, you know, when we started the project, um, uh, you know, Amazon had already opened a huge lead in the ecosystem and we were starting to see a really strong uh, convergence of, um, you know, ISVs and a lot of other organizations around that, uh, around the, um, the Amazon ecosystem. So, and we step back a little bit and we're really thinking about like, well, what can we do to kind of change the change the game some? How can we be a little disruptive? We knew that it was going to take a while for Google to build out the strength and the go-to-market side of the house, you know, get that enterprise readiness that it needed to really compete, which I think they've done a fabulous job under uh, Thomas Kieran, by the way. But um, but it was also clear that if we didn't do something quite disruptive, um, we would, you know, have a really hard time competing over time. And that, that really motivated me to think outside the box a little bit and uh, look at other options. Yeah, well, you know, when we met, uh, I was the CMO of Mesosphere. And uh, what I think is really interesting about the CNCF and Kubernetes origin story is that you actually embraced these alternative technologies. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about what drove that thinking and how that became part of the foundational ethos of the CNCF? You know, it's, it's really interesting because um, it's funny. You know, I, I remember this one moment where, um, you know, Joe and I were uh, kind of working on Compute Engine. And it was, it was really kind of sad because I think the world had had an opportunity to normalize on something like the a virtual machine uh, image definition as, as something that could be relatively ubiquitous. Um, 
but that just never happened. And I remember turning to Joe while we were kind of working on the project, I just had this sort of like moment where I was like, you know, whoever solves the problem associated with packaging and deploying software atomically, kind of like the way we do within Borg, is ultimately going to just have this amazing uh, sort of, you know, run of it. They're going to be able to be quite disruptive to the industry. But we were busy on, on Compute Engine. So eventually, um, once we got to a point where you know Compute Engine was was uh, you know largely um, kind of ideated and was, was on Rails, we we started playing with some ideas. And one of the things that immediately caught our attention was Docker. It was it was funny because I remember um, you know someone mentioning this to me like way 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 back when way before Docker was even popular. Like hey, you should really be paying attention to this. It's it's kind of a neat model. Um, and when we started really getting stuck into it, it was it was like one of those moments where like you know wow, we should really have thought of this right. Like it's it was such an elegant way to, you know, express a unit of, you know, um, deployment. Um, but the thing that was most elegant about it wasn't necessarily the technology, which was, you know, by Google's way of thinking, somewhat uh, mundane. It was really the experience that had been created right. about, around it, that recognition that that Linux syscall layer was um, was such a powerful abstraction, and, and that really got the wheels turning. You know, we started thinking about like, well, what would this look like done upright? And there were certainly some projects in the in the uh, in the ecosystem that were interesting, but more importantly, the way that you know my other friend Brennan um, Brennan Burns, who we were working with at the time, described it as like we kind of had the puzzle box when everyone was trying to figure out you know how to fit the pieces together. We'd seen how this would work at scale, um, and that really motivated us to do something new. And and it, it became obvious that we had to do this through the lens of the community. You know, once we we just saw like the disproportional level of attention and traction and engagement Docker was receiving you know, versus the relative maturity of the technology, it was clear that if we could create something righteous, meaning that had a lot of the sensibilities that we'd come to take for granted at a place like Google, that we could do it in a way that brought the community with us, we could create something quite special. And I don't know which of the two it was that, um, you know, kind of originally, you know, came up with a crazy idea to, uh, you know, to, to make a run at an open source project, which became Kubernetes, it was either Brennan or Joe. I, I just don't remember. But they're like, hey, what would it look like to do this? And, you know, I thought about it a bit and we're like, yeah, like, let's give it a go and see what happens. And, uh, you know, it, did, it definitely worked out okay in the end. I, I, I think it did. I think, you know, one of the things I've really always enjoyed about you is how methodical you are in your strategic planning. You know, there's always some game theory equation going on in your head. And I think that is why CNCF ended up being the way it is. I think a large part of it had had to do with just your conviction that this was the the proper way to uh, uh, to change an industry. And, and it certainly has. I mean, I think we say Kubernetes has has changed the industry and it was is continuing to change the industry. Um, so, so somewhere along the line, you left Google um, and you co-founded a little company called Heptio. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about, about that. It was really interesting. Um, you know, while I was at Google, I was working on, um, you know, so Kubernetes was on Rails and I started to kind of play with some other ideas in the space. Uh, uh, you know, what would the next abstraction up look like? Um, you know, how would we think about creating a services ecosystem on top of it? And I uh, was working on a couple of things there, uh, one of which was the uh, Apogee acquisition. And I, I kind of got friendly with um, with uh, Chet Kapoor, who who was the kind of founding CEO of, of Apogee. And he said something to me which kind of just stuck in my head. You know, he was like, you know, to succeed in, uh, to succeed in, a, in a startup, you, you really need to look for a moment of disruption where you know the set of incumbents are are not able to move as quickly as they might like, where there's a high uh, sort of total addressable market, and uh, and you're you're sort of in a situation where that's what you can create a successful business on, and that like it kind of clicked for me. I was like, wow, we're never going to see, I'm never going to see these circumstances again. But it was also for me um, an opportunity to really kind of step back a little bit and walk the journey with customers. You know, I. I'd looked at the sort of circumstance where I was thinking about like, well, do I want to do another Kubernetes? Um, I, was, I was sure that there was another Kubernetes in that next layer up. So, so I thought there would be another Kubernetes in there somewhere, right? Like, um, you know, some of the ideas around, you know, that eventually evolved into things like service mesh and, and some of those technologies. But the, the really interesting opportunity for me personally was the opportunity to engage with customers where they were, to be an effective ambassador for this, this very rich open source community. Uh, and bridge the gap between enterprise organizations that were looking to get 
more intrinsically aligned with upstream technology and uh, and the communities that were supporting them. And so that that's really what you know caused me to 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 go out and do to Heptio. And um, you know, my friend Joe was uh, he had he had decided to. Uh, retire which was kind of hilarious because he loves right. working. i remember that i and didn't so, believe him when he when he tried but i don't know like and, and eventually he was like hey when we're doing a startup when we're doing a startup and i, I just want to work with joe again too i'll be honest like that was uh, i've always enjoyed his uh his perspective on things and so that that really yeah. motivated us and uh, you know that one worked out okay too so we were very pleased with um with the traction we made in a relatively small amount of time in terms of just helping some larger uh enterprise organizations start to make this journey towards cloud native technologies. What was the most surprising thing that you learned on your journey at Heptio? I don't know if this is surprising, but it's something that I would I certainly took to heart as a, as a leader. Um, when I look back on, you know, what we created and, and the impact that uh, the team we brought together is, is having within my business unit and within VMware is, you know, there's no substitute for culture. Um, I think if you can establish a a very kind of effective cultural bar, if you can design your culture to the problem at hand, um, and if you hold yourselves to a very high standard, you will it becomes self perpetuating. Um, the, the quality of individuals we brought in um, have just done tremendous work, you know, within the parameters of the community, within the parameters of VMware, and I'm, I couldn't be more proud of just the people. Like it's it's, uh, and I think that really just started with being very very deliberate about the culture we were creating. What were the pillars of the culture? It's funny you ask that. Um, there were there were kind of three pivot, uh, sort of pillars of the culture that um, uh, that we established. The first was what I used to say was honest technology. Um, you know, we are a organization that is in service of the community and in service of our customers, and what we build is honest technology. So, you know, we stand behind the way that we build. We stand behind what we build. We we take a great degree of of, of pride and delight in, in creating honest technology. Um, the second kind of, you know, cultural element that, um, you know, I used to push a lot was carry the fire, like a real passion for disruption an authentic desire to create something that was bigger than, than anyone had seen. Um, and this, this willingness to do the hard thing, to walk the hard road when you have to. Um, and then the third element that we, we put a lot of, of, of emphasis on was we before me. Um, the idea that um, you know it's it's uh, it's about the quality of the, the the team, it's about the quality of the community, it's about um, doing that little bit of extra work so that someone else doesn't have to do it tomorrow. Um, and obviously, the, there's an ocean of nuance associated with each of those three uh, those three elements. But just having that anchor of um, you know, culture that was really um, understandable and, and manifest every day. It informed the decisions that we made, it informed who we hired, informed how we interviewed. And I, I think that really set us up for success. Yeah. And uh, for for um, for those who don't know, and probably two people in the audience, Heptio was acquired by VMware. And, uh, you know, back when when you and I were working closely together, uh, we, we used to get the question, right? VMs or containers, like which is going to win? And uh, I think we knew uh, that the answer was yes. Um, and now I think definitively it's yes. But can you tell me a little bit how Heptio and I guess more importantly to the Kubernetes community, Kubernetes has been integrated into VMware and uh, what is the VMware Tanzu Grid, I believe is the product. Maybe to kind of navigate us. Yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, I see containers and VMs as being, um, they're fundamentally different technologies. One solves a packaging and distribution problem. The other solves a, uh, a hardware isolation and abstraction problem. And we're certainly seeing, uh, often as not a kind of yes and series of outcomes. I think, you know, almost every vendor now has some form of hypervisor isolated, um, you know, Kubernetes uh, or container abstraction. And, and we're certainly no exception to that. Um, you know, for me, when Pat approached us, um, you know, we certainly weren't looking to sell. I, 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 you know, like we were, we were doing great. We were having a lot of fun. But it was also clear that to have the impact that I wanted to have on the industry, we, we did need a bigger boat. It's like that, that scene from Jaws where you, you see the size of the opportunity, you see the size of the impact you can have, and you, you need that bigger boat, right? And, um, and what I was, you know, 
so uh, excited about was the opportunity to use the strengths that VMware was bringing to the table. Um, it, you know, that, that incredibly trusted brand in enterprise computing and awareness of how to actually operationalize at scale. Uh, and understanding that, you know, the first 80% of the work is, is uh, you know, only, you know, the, getting to that 80% po point is only 20% of the effort, right? Like that last 20% of, of enterprise technology is really hard. There's just an inordinate amount of effort associated with dealing with the edge cases and getting everything set up. And, you know, to me, I saw this, uh, this impeccable opportunity to, you know, be a part of VMware becoming something more than just a virtualization company. Obviously, VMware already was well down the franchise road, uh, had a lot of different um, kind of, you know, businesses. But being in a position where we could build out what I thought of as being a legitimate meta cloud, you know, something that would make on-premises, public cloud, and you know, increasingly the network edge look consistent um, was ex just, you know, incredibly exciting to me. And so as I've been on this uh, on this journey, you know, I, I always think of, you know, the kind of, in my head, I'm pretty simplistic. You know, one, I want to deliver a ubiquitous uh, Kubernetes substrate that's consistent everywhere. Two, that's not really interesting unless you have an effective control plane to manage it. And then three, I want to render up uh, the software supply chain that enables developers to produce business outcomes in that destination. And, um, you know, through the initial, you know, integration into um, VMware, we just massively extended our reach to all of those existing uh, facilities and became a really strong anchor for VMware's own navigation and migration to support public cloud computing. Um, and then, you know, from a futures perspective, you know, it's all about the edge. Like the, this is where I see the most uh, excitement, you know, for me personally. Um, I think it's going to be a huge growth area and a highly disruptive um, area of innovation you know, the coming years. And I, I just can't be, couldn't be happier to be a part of that, that journey at a company like VMware. Well, I'm glad you, you brought up Edge because I was about to transition to that since this is the, the, the Edge day. Um, so, so when you say the opportunity at Edge, uh, and I won't make you define Edge, but I, I want to see like, what, what are the opportunities that you see for Kubernetes? Well, I mean, the whole point of Kubernetes was that it would be that Goldilocks abstraction that enables you to treat um, you know, most infrastructure consistently. And the opportunity here is is no different. Um, you know, I think, you know, obviously there's a very broad, you know, array of definitions for, you know, what edge computing is from, you know, thick edge to thin edge, near edge, far edge, however you want to kind of uh, taxonomize it. And so the starting point, I think, is just having that normalized substrate, like um, that compute substrate that you can then tie back to a control plane. So you can start to reason about your edge, whether it's you know geographically distributed, whether it's running in a variety of different you know polities, whatever the case may be, um, as being a common destination, and making that destination accessible to developers that are building physical outcomes is really interesting. We've seen so much uh, excitement and engagement around things like reactive uh, computing patterns. We've seen the emergence of you know CDN-based capabilities that's really addressing the kind of outward flow of, of developer assets, you know, to the edge uh, device. The really exciting thing is what about the reverse? Like how do we start to kind of synthesize and process information that's being generated at the edge? How do we do that in a topology aware way that's making appropriate use of what computational resources home there, uh, you know, balancing computational consumption with network um, backbone consumption. Um, and that to me is just, I could not be more excited about the the opportunity to 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 look to participate in the, in that part of the journey. So let me unpack that a little bit. So um, if you think about you know Kubernetes as being a oversimplistically, but uh, I think usefully a a platform that will take a container and based on a declaration run it somewhere, mm -hmm. and um, in a single data center. Um, there's a set of you know common declarations that we might make that the the scheduler can interpret to figure out where those workloads run within that cluster in that data center. Do you see that metaphor uh, translating? You know, the, the ten thousand or the ten thousand servers in my my single data center that different from the ten thousand servers in the you know five hundred data centers that are that I might be using at the edge. Is, is, do those yeah. metaphors translate, do you think? I, th I think they do to a certain extent, but you have to recognize that it, it, there's sort of added complexity to the problem, right? So the, 
The interesting challenge with uh, with Edge is, um, you know, one is you're just dealing with the scale of operations it, within within the logical construct of a data center. You can afford to have an operating model that you know, that scales, you know, somewhat linearly with the number of uh, you know potential clusters or you know, pick your poison. Um, as you start looking at edge, it, it changes the dynamics. You have to have something that scales, you know, pretty much, you know, like just the, the cost of operations just doesn't scale with the, uh, the the deployment topology. Otherwise, things are going to get bad. You can't send uh, an IT operator to every edge location to deal with something that you have to update, whereas you could do that in the old days. And Kubernetes is is just an incredibly important technology from that perspective. It introduces a determinism in terms of how you can reason about deploying something. So you can take that package software and run it there, much like you could in a data center. But the thing that's really elegant about Kubernetes isn't just about like, oh, I can make placement decisions about virtual machine instances. Kubernetes has created a, a controller pattern. Like, you know, Brennan Burns, one of the founders of the project, so is a creative genius as far as I'm concerned. He was also a robotics professor before this and so he was all geeking out about you know kind of control uh, theory and that certainly is a key element of what kubernetes is it's it's not just about containers and deployment it's about creating an appropriate set of control loops so that what's within the boundaries of that that controller um, can be managed at atomically by that controller so it's it's not just about getting your application out there it's about the care and feeding if something goes wrong uh, the restart dynamics the, the ability to deterministically update it yeah, making informed decisions about uh, you know scalability in those in those locations without access to uh, a centralized control plane, perhaps. You know, in some situations, um, you know, I certainly work with a lot of organizations where you know some of those environments are periscoping in their behavior. They might be LTE connected, and there might be a network outage, or um, they might be on a cruise ship that sails out to sea every you know X months and it's just not connected at all. And Kubernetes lends itself so well to that um, because it's not just about you know, delivering static technology. It's about delivering well thought through controllers that can deal with a lot of those parameters. If you can, you know, if you can think about it, you can program it and you can, you know, push it into Kubernetes. And not just at the infrastructure level, but increasingly at the application level as well. Um, so I think that's going to be uh, incredibly powerful. So when you think about the edge, you know, there, there are some pretty fundamental changes that happen at the access network, that last mile, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times the ownership of the server <laughs> transfers from a cloud company to uh, an enterprise. You know, um, how do you see? Um, how do you, how do you view that the the that that transition, the edge of the last mile market network? Do you see that getting blurrier? Do you do you imagine uh, you know uh, cloud workloads being spawned on? Private equipment. I mean, how, how do you how do you view that? I think it's a it's a fascinating uh, it's a fascinating topic of discussion. And like, if I I, I think anyone who tells you they know exactly how it's going to go is probably selling something. Um, I think there's there's still a lot of figuring out to do. But you know, I'd say there are a couple of trends. We will see the cloud providers come with deeply vertically integrated capabilities that are being rendered out into uh, into those environments, and they have some very strong assets at their disposal. Um, um, I think we will certainly see some amazing opportunities for organizations to create um, kind of multi-tenant based outcomes in those types of destinations. So independently of who owns a physical piece of serving gear, there's no reason why you couldn't create um, an API economy or a, an edge function economy that can leverage out, you know, whoever, you know, put that piece of infrastructure up there, as long as you can normalize that infrastructure as long as you can set up the, the, the tenancy model and the, the isolation boundaries sufficiently, um, you're in a situation where this like whole new economies will, will likely emerge around this. Um, and I think that that landscape will be quite fluid for some time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly, it's a fascinating dynamic, exactly as you said, as you, you know, there's these sort of classic boundaries of, of ownership and um, that's very much in flux at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, uh, you know you can run Kubernetes on a on a Raspberry Pi on a device that's actually in the field, and I think it's very different than running Kubernetes on a uh, you know on a server that happens to be at the base of a cell tower or in a carrier hotel or in a regional data center. Um, but I think both are reasonable and applicable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do think so, and it's interesting because there's a there's a decent analog here to Linux if you think about. 
the form hmm. factors that Linux is is deployed into. Linux is deployed into everything from cell phone sized devices to mainframes and everything in between. Um, and if you think about what Kubernetes is emerging is it's effectively a it's a way to program distributed systems patterns. It's a way to kind of deliver distributed systems patterns. And um, and I think the the analog is is pretty is pretty clear. Um, I don't you know I think Kubernetes complements Linux. Um, I'm not sufficiently arrogant to like assume that it will have the duty cycle that Linux has had. I, I hope it does. Um, I, th I think it likely will. Um, but we still have work to do as a community to make that true. Um, but the the potential of the, the sort of the versatility of that model I think is is quite strong and. Uh, we're certainly heading in, in a positive direction with the technology. If you could um, provide the the audience of developers some direction on where you would like to see the community invest in Kubernetes to uh, exploit some of the new opportunities at Edge, what what would you what would you advise them to do? You know, it's interesting. I, I was thinking a little bit about this before uh, before we came on. I, I think there's there's obviously you know, normalizing a, a variety of different form factors, um, making sure that we have effective conformance standards around a variety of different form factors, effectively making sure that we get those profiles in place so that, you know, if you're building an application for a certain class of deployment, there's a well-qualified, um, you know, profile because, you know, when you're running something on Raspberry Pi, it's not going to feel like running something in your, in your, your, your mainstream data center. So, um, I think that's certainly an area that uh, you know behooves us to to emphasize and focus on. You know, interestingly, I've been thinking a fair bit uh, recently about um, the intersection of WebAssembly and and some of these technologies. Um, you know, there's an interesting little project from uh, Microsoft called Crustlet. Um, but when we start looking at uh, the, the class and shape and nature of um, of like things like edge functions, the ability to write a relatively small sliver of code that can run in a massively multi-tenant context, uh, have very high levels of of uh, security isolation. It really starts to feel a lot like WebAssembly, and so I'd love to see things like the WebAssembly um, systems interfaces protocols uh, solidify. I think that could become quite interesting in this world, and it's obviously very early days, but um, that's something I'd love to see us. Uh, us think about and you know and then like really tooling up the uh, the developer experience around some of those pieces would be be quite interesting just enabling folks to start thinking about building um you know building applications for these these types of, of deployments where various pieces are honed in a variety of different destinations depending on the the, the, the sort of cost economics of, of where something is run is, is going to be quite interesting um and again it's all going to come back to the control plane um you're not going to be a cool vendor if you don't have a uh, a, a control plane that enables you to deliver outcomes into these types of destinations. Um, at the end of the day, relatively few organizations are going to have the capabilities to, you know, operate effectively a, a full-on SaaS service to, to you know, think through the mechanics of how um, these types of applications are built and delivered and uh, managed and updated and, and observed. And that's going to be interesting. Um, and then the final piece, I think, that's going to be quite interesting, and this is something I don't think the community is, is focused quite enough on yet, but it's certainly an area that we're focused on within VMware, which is observability um, becomes really interesting when you're dealing really with something of this and, and really yeah. important. Like, you know, what what does it look like? You know, what does APM look like for an edge-based um, solution where you have, you know, a, a pretty you know, a, a pretty fragmented or pretty hierarchical topology. Um, how do you reason about, uh, you know, a metric system that's um, thinking about it? how do you make that sufficiently hierarchical so that you don't overwhelm the network links with metrics, but you're able to retain what you need to retain from a local deployment perspective. Um, so that's going to be an area of, of, you know, certainly significant emphasis for us. And I think an area that the, the community would do well to pay attention to. Yeah, I think the 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 whole telemetry, the importance of telemetry to edge computing has been uh, underappreciated. And mm -hmm. it's not just telemetry come off, coming off the applications, it's telemetry coming off the network, it's telemetry coming off of the operational technology. I mean, if one of your micro data centers out at the edge goes on to battery power, 
you probably want to make some intelligent decisions about starting up, you know, backup workloads yeah. somewhere and starting to load balance tra traffic around. And right now, getting that information is very hard because it's not something that, you know, uh, it's it's probably buried behind some CAN bus interface that you don't have access to as a software developer. Uh, and even you did, you might not know what to do with it. So it's a, it's the telemetry piece. I think you're right. That's really yeah. really underappreciated. Um, from the the from a use case perspective, um, and I you know I it, it's you know the the you know the autonomous car example is the one one who's to be every, everybody's favorite. Although I think people that really think about it don't expect the infrastructure to be the driving factor for autonomous vehicles. Maybe for coordinating them, but not not the thing. But if you look like over the next let's say eighteen months, mm -hmm. like what 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 are the use cases that you think are realistically going to emerge that excite you? Well, the, the two areas where I see the, the most kind of um, energy around are in the uh, retail and manufacturing segments. Um, look, pretty much every segment you can think of is, uh, is, is, is chewing on the edge problem. Um, retail in particular um, is an area where I'm seeing things moving very, very quickly. Um, you know, obviously, the, the global pandemic has forced a lot of retailers to you know, take a long, hard look at how they do business, how they operate. And, you know, the, um, you know, the, the old um, narrative around necessity and invention, um, it's, uh, we're, we're seeing so much traction there. So getting, um, getting to a point where we have far more, you know, computational resource in, in, in a uh, form factor that is appropriate for the destination, that is, you know, sufficiently operable that you can roll it out to a, a pretty broad array of sites to unlock everything from, you know, relatively simple, uh, you know, experiences in, um, you know, small, you know, branch locations or uh, small retail locations to running, you know, really high-end inferencing workloads and, uh, you, know, you know, creating these next generation um, shopping experiences um, is interesting. There's, that, that segment in particular is moving very quickly. Um, Manufacturing, I think, over a slightly longer horizon is is becoming you know very very focused on getting better computational resource and you know a better control of the computational resource. But the problem with a lot of manufacturing is that that's generally tied to a pretty high capex moment, and it's a it's a sort of much more kind of complex um, rollout. But um, you know, certainly from what I see, well, you mentioned COVID nineteen, and you know, my experience is that you know, every every manufacturer had a ten year automation plan that's now a four year automation plan because mm -hmm. <laughs> of COVID. Because nobody wants exactly. to be stuck in that position again, where they're shutting down the lines because they can't get people close enough. Yeah, really, really interesting times. Um, so, Craig, the um, uh, what do you think the, the the biggest challenges are to adoption of edge devices and edge technology? I think it always comes back to the people um, skills. Um, you know, the technology I think is is emerging. Being able to identify, you know, just given the noise, being able to distill a signal from the noise and uh, you know make smart bets. Um, you know, getting the the skill set in place that's necessary to. Uh, you know, start running a series of experiments, um, you know, navigating so that it, you're not making these kind of huge, you know, cap CapEx heavy investments that you can actually start to build into what you're doing um, and, and build your organizational skills at the same rate as you're, you're starting to, to engage and deploy these technologies is, is, is key. Um, the control plane, you have to have a, a, a sort of a hierarchical, highly available um, control plane to support this. Um, that's necessary because it's not just about, you know, I think a lot of folks, you know, overemphasize, well, what does it take to deploy a Kubernetes to this destination? Well, that's, that's one thing. Updating it, that's another. Right. But then, like, how do I deploy an application into 10,000 retail locations? How do I run an experiment in two of those and get the results of that experiment? How do I make informed decision when I'm ready to deploy that update out to the other 9,998 locations if you're running a sufficiently large operation. Um, and, you know, without that control plane technology getting really buttoned down and being able to reason about the control plane is something that spans both the infrastructure, but also the supply chain that renders those application capabilities, components, experiences is going to be uh, key. And I'd say this, the second area, and this is, you know, as we start looking at, you know, the, the energy and impetus to start to have more multi-tenant um, edge-based facilities is going to be uh, a challenge. 
Um, you know, Kubernetes itself was certainly never built as a kind of natively multi-tenant um, uh, environment. So being able to have better lines of isolation, um, uh, security, a tenancy model that's 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 smart for much lighter weight um, kind of function like use cases. It's going to be a, a big a big challenge for this this industry. Sounds like a lot of exciting work to get done. Mm -hmm. so, Craig, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Um, how can people find you online at Line, and learn learn more about your work? Um, well, you can always at me at uh, cmcluck uh, on Twitter. Um, and then I occasionally post blogs on Medium if you look at my name, Craig McClucky. Um, but yeah, love to hear from folks. And uh, thank you so much for having me on. It's been a lot of fun chatting to you, Matt. Yeah, thanks a lot, Craig. Really appreciate it.